Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And just a couple of quick announcements. We now have a private Facebook group where you can be part of the We Don't Die listeners community. And I don't know if you're like me, but not too many people in my life know this side of me. And it'll be a place that we can all share. You're going to be encouraged to go after your dreams. Hard days, good days, you know, it's... It's a tight-knit community um, for all of us. So if you're a Facebook user, you can go to We Don't Die Listeners. So just type that in the box, We Don't Die Listeners. And then you have to press uh, Request to Join. And of course, I'll say yes, because that's what we do. But I do want it to be private. Um, Anyway, so then we can get started. And then also, September 15th through 17th, 2017, I will be one of 27 or so speakers at an afterlife symposium. It's a big conference dedicated to the afterlife, cutting-edge information in science and medicine that's got proof of the afterlife, um, lots of doctors and scientists and cool people, uh, and then even ta- uh, talking about how to get in touch with your loved ones, the different communication techniques, and then also preparing for our end of life, because like it or not, these bodies are all going to shut down one day, and how to gracefully transition. So there's going to be nothing like it on the planet, and I know some people can't make it because they live far away, uh, but I know some of the sessions will be recorded. So if you're slightly interested or just interested in looking to see who's going to be speaking there, I encourage you to go to afterlifestudies.org. Okay, so let's start with the show. Uh, Coming to us today from Melbourne, Australia, we have Sandy Coughlin. Now, in times of grief, fear, and despair, most of us have, have asked, is there really an afterlife? When Sandy's mother became seriously ill in 1987, she sat on her back doorstep night after night and asked the universe that very same question. She doubted anyone was listening, yet strangely, her life began to change. So over her next 24 years, as she continued to search for evidence, she slowly found what she was looking for, and the answer came. Sandy is a writer, and she's the author of the book, Heaven Knows, A Personal Journey in Search of Evidence. Sandy Coughlin, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you, Sandra, and uh, thank you for having me. And g'day from the land down under to everyone. Yeah, it's it's so exciting because for me, uh, recording this, it's 8 a.m., and for you, it's 10 (laughs) p.m., But, and you're in summer and we're in winter. But, I uh, know. That's the world for you. Yeah. And, you know, really, I mentioned the Facebook group. A lot of people don't like Facebook, and I get it. But for me, it connects the world. It's how I met you. It's how I first saw exactly. your I profile be it. and your book. And I thought, I need to get to know this woman. And so now here we are, friends on the opposite sides of the globe. We are. So thank you, thank you for being my friend. First and thank foremost. you for asking me. Yeah, I think this is going to be great. So Sandy, a little bit about yourself. I know uh, you're retired now, um, but back for a career, you had said you were a writer. Was that correct? Well, I've always been a writer, but I also worked in television for many years. Um, I basically had to leave work when my mother got so ill, Sandra, because she went to bed one night and didn't get up for a year Uh, and nobody could figure out what was wrong with her. She slept 20 hours out of every 24 hours. She ate little. Um, I just had to be there. I knew she was dying. Um, It didn't quite happen the way I expected, but I was convinced that she was dying and I needed to be there with her. And so I left work and and, uh, looked after her for, as it happened, the next 24 years. Wow. And she was uh, she was very ill. She ended up in a wheelchair, um, but uh, that was my my career for the, the those twenty four years looking after my mother. Oh, that's and and thing. I think it's important to point out um, I was an only child, and my mother was an only child, and my parents were divorced when I was about seven. Mm-hmm. So she was very important to me, and uh, it's not like I had siblings I could call on or aunts or uncles or anything like that. You know, it's just you. Just me and her. Yeah. And I have a very special relationship with my mom, so I can understand. I can understand. So what happened? I mean, I'm assuming 
after the 24 years, on the 25th years, there was no more mom? Uh, you were asking me to give the end of my book away. Oh. <laughs> but no, you're right. Um, she did eventually die, um, but it was uh, a long journey, and it was a gift. It was a gift for, well, it was a gift for her because by the time she died, she was in a wheelchair. She was 88. She she did very well. Um, but she there was a lot of things she couldn't do that she wanted to do. But it was also a gift for me in many ways because it set me on my journey. I mean, the whole journey, the 24 years was a journey. Yeah. Because as, as you pointed out, I sat on the back doorstep every night and begged the universe to show me the way and tell me whether there was something beyond. And it did. But I didn't get it. You know how we have these things happen and we, we you know, I was a skeptic. Like you, Sandra, I was a skeptic. And when skeptics can't explain something, the easiest thing is to just ignore them. Yeah. And that's what I did. You know, these things happen. Oh, it's a coincidence. Or it can't be a coincidence. Oh, I'll think about it another time, you know. And luckily for me, I kept a journal that I never looked at, I just wrote in, and it was only after my mother died that I started going through the journal and realizing the pattern, seeing the pattern that took place um, over those years. And the, the people who gave me books to read, um, the, the television shows that I saw, interviews, um, things like that, and a lot of personal things that happened as well that basically were paranormal now that I look back on them but at the time I was too busy worrying about my mother and looking after her and I just didn't pay much attention to them you know I, I think I expected sitting out in the back doorstep every night I expected some lightning blast from the sky and God's hand would come down and say yes there is an afterlife when that didn't happen well these things weren't important but they got me there eventually. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just so important that we talk about this because we're each on our own personal journey. And, Absolutely. And oh, I hate to say it, but in times that our heart is ripped right open, you know, the, the worst times in our life, the most suffering, the toughest challenges are often the things that get us looking at our own life and are the things that... Um, you know, people say suffering is what causes the the best soul growth, you know, and that's kind of hard pill to swallow, but I can really get it. You know, out of the death of my dad came uh, all of my research and even having a fear of dying in the beginning. It's, you know, it, it was all based on that. So, Well, what would we learn? You know, yeah. if everything was perfect, everything was wonderful, what a waste of time it would be. And I know now that when I look back on my life, not just those 24 years, but all the way back, everything that happened to me that appeared to be difficult or bad or major problem, something good came out of it. But you can only see that in retrospect. Oh my. You, you don't know when it's happening. You think, why am I being punished? Yeah. But then later you look back and say, ah, but if that hadn't happened, then this wouldn't have happened and that was so much better. Yes. You know? Yeah. So let me just ask you, on your... Um, search for evidence. What kind of things started happening, or um, oh, like, what do you have? Yeah, what do you have in your um, the basket that you've collected of evidence for the afterlife? Well, one of the things that happened um, was that I had a beloved dog. Um, she was <laughs> somebody dumped four newborn pups under my car one night. Oh! Like, without I know, I know, and they were crying. I heard them crying. I went out and rescued them, and spent two weeks bottle feeding them until I found a foster mother, and ended up keeping one of them. She was such a cute little puppy. Um, she ended up being a, a Rottweiler German Shepherd cross, and grew and grew and grew into a gentle giant. Yeah, big girl. But she was very, very precious to me. And she um, unfortunately had to be put to sleep. She became very, very unwell. And about three weeks, I, I, was, I really grieved for her. It was my first, see, this is the thing, Sandra, it was my first contact with death because not having siblings and aunts and uncles and family, I didn't know anybody who died. I'd never been through that situation. Um, but when, when she died, I thought that was, you know, 
worst thing that could possibly happen, my beloved dog. She used to sit out in the back doorstep with me, um, you know, helping to comfort me. Yes. Two, uh, three weeks later, I felt a jump on my bed. Now, when she jumped on the bed, she was a big girl, so the whole bed shook, and my bed shook, and I wasn't asleep. And I looked up over the bedclothes, and there she was, standing on the foot of my bed. And I can't to this day explain why I said, Oh, Muffin, lay down. And she flopped down like she always did, and the bed shook again, and I pulled the covers back, and then I went, Oh, my God, she died three weeks ago. And I looked again, and she wasn't there. Wow. And and I just... The next day, I just dismissed that as I must have been asleep. I must have been nearly asleep, you know. These are the kind of things you do when you don't want to come to terms with it. You know, you say, that was impossible. I have to say that the thing that happened next was very, very hard to come to terms with. A year later, okay, I was with her as she was being put to sleep. And I said to her at the time, you're going to make me cry now. Oh, I said to her at the time, I'll never replace you, mustn't. You'll never be replaced. You're my precious darling. Yes. A year later, I heard about a, a cavalier, King Charles Spaniel, that it was being mistreated. And I could not stand the thought of any animal being mistreated. No. So I went and collected her. I actually had to pay the owner for her, but that was fine. Bought her home. Ah, I've got to go back on this story. Um... When I came home from Muffin being put to sleep, she had a, a precious red ball, a, a lead and a collar and a rolled rug. And I just couldn't throw them out. Couldn't bear to, it was like throwing her out. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't bear to see them either. So I put them in a plastic bag. I took them out to the garage and I put them in the back of an old a drawer out there. And that's where they stayed for a year. I'd never opened that drawer again. When I bought this Cavalier King Charles home and I put her on the floor, she and my mother was in the room at the time, and she's saying, oh, let me look at her. Isn't she lovely? The, the little Cavalier ran across the room, jumped up on the couch, started pouring at a cushion and pulled it away and there was Muffin's Red Bull behind it. Wow. I didn't, I didn't put it there. My mother couldn't. She didn't even know it was there in the garage. She couldn't get out there. She was walking on a walking frame by this stage. I, that was very hard to explain away, as you can imagine. You know, so these are the kind of things that kept happening over these years when I, after I was sitting out in the back doorstep asking for answers. So things like that. And a few years later, um, something else happened. My grandmother, my mother's mother, was in a nursing home and she was 99 and she was still as bright as a button. Wow. She used to watch the cricket on television and and she used to watch horse racing and read the newspaper and that sort of thing. We went to visit her one day and she was chatting away and suddenly she said, oh, you wouldn't believe who's moved in here. My mother. Mother's here. She's in room seven. We've been having such lovely chats. And I thought, mm, she's finally losing it, you know. Mm-hmm. And then she'd talk about the cricket. And then she'd say, oh, by the way, Dr. McCann has come to see me the other day. And Dr. McCann was our old doctor about 50 years ago. Oh. You know, he was, he was past retirement age then. Then, Sandra, she said, he told me that I'm dead from the head down to the waist and from my feet up to my hips. And when they meet in the middle, you'll be back to get me. And then she went on to another conversation. And, and she, within about three weeks, she'd gone. Now, you know, I had to start thinking, well, first of all, I thought maybe she's just losing it. But then I thought, well, how did you know? I thought, oh, of course, three weeks. She's 99. Of course, she would die soon anyway, you know. But these are the little things that, that kept crop, cropping up over those years that made me start thinking, maybe there's something to this, you know. Yeah, definitely. Especially the ball. Sorry? Uh, no, definitely. There was a woman I spoke to, Penny Sartori is, is her name. Oh, she's lovely, isn't she? Yeah, and this is one of my earliest episodes, a couple of years ago. And the stories that she had, because uh, was she in hospi- hospice? Oh. Uh, no, she's um, um, 
uh, what do you call it, uh, intensive care nurse. Intensive care nurse. Well, anyway, she's mm. been by the bedside of plenty of people uh, before they passed and as clear and lucid and mm. uh, know what's going on, but then they also see people that have come there for them or with them or, you know, just people from the past. It, it, it's so beautiful to hear those kind of stories. Well, one of the other things that my grandmother said when she was seeing these people, while we we did tell her that Muffin had died because she loved Muffin, mm-hmm. we didn't tell her that we'd replaced her. We didn't tell her that we'd got another dog because we didn't want her to think, you know, that she, they've just replaced her. On our way out that day, she said, oh, by the way, I love your little new dog. She's so sweet. Oh. Now, that really threw me because nobody else visited her. Nobody else knew about it. I started to think, well, how is it possible? I mean, I'd, I'd heard of out-of-body experiences, but, you know, with NDEs or at the Monroe Institute or something. But how did she know that there was a little dog when the dog we had before was a big dog? And she actually said little black and white dog. Well, she was black, white and tan. Um, she'd been to visit us. I'm sure of it. Man, we we human beings are so much more than we think sometimes. Oh. I mean, to say we were souls having a human experience, we are. You know, there's Absolutely. Oh, oh, I couldn't I, agree with you more. Sandy, I love your but, stories. But I'm, but I'm dismissing these things, Sandra. I'm yeah. just sort of saying, oh, yeah, that doesn't mean anything. Oh, that's a coincidence. That's, you know. But when I look back over all these things, I realized that there were messages all along there, you know. Can you tell us some more stories? Your stories are great. Oh, thank you. Um, well, how about I tell you how I how I came to write the book in the first sure. place? Because while I, I actually did three years' research on it, but when I think about it, I did 24 years' research right. because I was researching it all those years. But I hadn't intended to write a book on it. It was just my own, for my own benefit. Mm-hmm. But I... I can't tell you why, but I I phoned, after my mother died, I phoned an elderly lady I hardly knew and uh, told her something that she needed to know. And she was so grateful uh, that, that I told her this and she said, look, you have brought me so much comfort, I can't begin to tell you how much comfort you brought me. You'll find out at the end of the book why I brought her comfort, but that's beside the point. Um, and I thought after that, look, there must be other people that feel that way because while I'd, I'd been reading books on NDEs, but the kind of people that read those are kind of people who usually are interested in the subject. What I discovered is that there's a lot of people, particularly those who were born pre-war or during the war, who don't even think about going into a bookshop and saying, look, I'm getting on, I'm a bit concerned about the fact that I'm going to die soon um, and I'd like to know if there's any books about it. Or, You know, they don't even, a lot of people don't even know what a near-death experience is. Mm-hmm. A lot of people, but the media is to blame for that because they tend to sort of say, John Smith was... Um, had a near-death experience today when he got halfway down the mountain and had to be rescued um, or almost walked in front of the bus, you know. They've taken that phrase and run with it and it's yes. lost its meaning. Right. So people don't sort of look for, for books about that subject. So I thought there are people grieving, there are people afraid of their own death, um, afraid of their spouse's death, and they don't know anything about this subject. So... That was basically what led me to write it. And then I started, I said, well, okay, I'm still a skeptic. You know, I really, I I need to read books on, more books and and manage to convince me. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I did was go looking for pre-Raymond Moody books or pre-Raymond Moody NDEs because a lot of skeptics say everybody who has an NDE is just, repeating what Dr. Moody put in his first book, Life After Life. Oh, I see. Because he was the first one to to research this and put it all in a book, you know, and he, he researched how people go through a tunnel, see a bright light, right. meet loved ones, etc. 
So I thought, well, if there'd been any before his book came out, they wouldn't be just saying what he'd said in the book. So I started looking for old ones, didn't think I'd find any. Oh, did I find them. There were so many out there, it was absolutely amazing. Um, one of the earliest ones I found was St. Teresa of Avila in 1565. Um, she she um, had a, a, well, she died actually, and she was being prepared for burial. And um, she said afterwards when she came back, when she her body was almost, she'd been dead for four days. I, I don't know the story behind this. I don't know whether she was revived or just came back to life. But she wrote in her journal, I wish I could give a description of at least the smallest part of what I have learned. But when I try to discover a way of doing so, I find it impossible. For while the light we see here and that other light are both light, there is no comparison between the two and the brightness of the sun seems quite dull if compared with the other. So, you know, she's seeing the light that people have described since Dr. Moody's book, and obviously this is four or five hundred years before um, before now. When, one interesting thing she said, Sandra, was um, she didn't want to come back. And she said, for the contempt that was left in me, for everything earthly was great. These things all seemed to me like dung. <laughs> I see how basely we are occupied. And I thought that was an interesting quote by a, a saint in 1565. But, but uh, oh, look, I found, I found lots of them. And they all were the same. They all said the same things that was in life after life. You know, and how is this possible? So that did that ease your skepticism, or it just kept you searching for? Ah, uh, it was. But when I kept finding them, and they kept talking about tunnels, and they kept talking about light, and they kept talking about all these things that that we now recognise as as an NDE. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's more people having them now because of the resuscitation technique. Sure. But you know, you have to say, look, these people didn't or read a book and say, well, I'll just say that I had an end. And why would they? No. You know? um, I even found a priest in the 6th century who had one and, and went through a gate that was brighter than normal daylight and the light was indescribable. And, and one man, a Dr. Charlia, found a second-hand book in a French bookshop, in a Paris bookshop, well, this was fairly recently, actually, this century, paid a dollar for it, and it was published in 1740, was written by a doctor, and had an, an NDE in there. Incredible. So, ah, you know, absolutely amazing. So, I look, am I still a skeptic? I think all of us have to be 1% skeptic. You know, we all, no matter how much you believe, I think there are times that you tend to say, well, maybe I'm kidding myself. Maybe I'm just telling myself this because I want to believe it. But then I open up my book and read some of the research I did and it puts my mind at rest because it's just too hard to, to ignore. Yeah, I think that's part of being human. I, I don't think we're meant to believe 24 hours a day, seven days a week of who we are I, I think um, that when we come to earth there's so much to learn and so much to explore and so much to experience and I don't know I don't like I, I'm totally with you because even for me recording hundreds of these shows uh, that, which are wonderful because it keeps it alive for me but left to my own devices you know some of the things that are miraculous that I've experienced Sandy my mind will just put to no that didn't really happen <laughs> I, know, I know why is that I, I mean surely life would be much nicer if we had 100% belief and, and there'd be no grief, there'd be no fear, there'd be no anxiety. But I think sometimes we're a bit afraid of it's all, it all seems too easy, you know, and we think maybe I'm just kidding myself. But that's down to 1% of the time now, 
you know, for the most part, I have I have no doubts. Um, it's it just there's too many stories. There's too much. I mean, you know, the story of Pamela Reynolds. No. The the you know the lady who had a um uh, an aneurysm, and the only way they could operate on her was actually. I called my chapter "Killing to Cure." They had to kill her for an hour uh, in order to operate, and they drained all her blood and froze it, and had her in a suspended state of animation. So that she she had no brain waves. She had she had she was dead for all intents and purposes, dead for an hour. She was able to describe the operation, the the um, equipment that they used that she'd never seen before. You know that that's how how is that possible? You know you you can't say skeptics will say that people who have an NDE during an operation, well, they didn't have enough anaesthetic, or they weren't really dead, or they only these things only happened as they were coming out of the anaesthetic. When you've got somebody dead for an hour, and the back of their head is being sawn open, and they don't have any blood, and their brain waves are being monitored, and they've got They've got things in their ears to monitor their brain waves that are making a clicking noise so loud that even if somebody was talking to you, you couldn't hear it, and she could hear what they were saying and repeated it back. Wow. How is that possible? I, I know that there's. I know I was one of those skeptics once that thought, "Yeah, it's just your brain shutting down. These are just images mm-hmm. that come to mind. The bright lights, just part of it." But as a skeptic, I don't, like the skeptic Sandra at that time didn't do the research to prove I'm right. <laughs> and, right. and even but did you know to do it though, Sandra? No, of course not. I mean, that's the point. No. You know, that's what I'm saying because there's a lot of people out there who, who want to believe, but they don't know that there's anywhere to look. The first time I went to get a book, I went to a bookshop. I knew about Life After Life because I had bought it when it first came out. And I put it on my table, my bedside table, and I left it there for about a year because I didn't want to open it. You know, hmm. I, I didn't think it was going to be anything in it for me. It had all these made, you know, wonderful claims in it. And in the end, I sent it to my grandmother because my grandfather had died and I didn't know him anyway. So, you know. But then I, had, I went back. I thought, okay, I need to do some research. So I went to a bookshop, picked it up, looked at it and thought, oh, I don't know about this. And in fact, Dr. Moody states, I've, I've got the quote right here, he states in the book um, that he doesn't believe that he's actually, um, he says, to my fellow philosophers, I would insist that I am not under the delusion that I have proven there is life after death. And I thought, well, this is not going to be a lot of good to me, is it? Right. So I said to the man in the bookshop, have you got any other books on this subject? And he said, oh, not really. There's not much of a call for this sort of thing. And then he said, oh, you might try in the religious section. And I said, oh. So I ended up buying the Life After Life and read it and thought, oh, look, all these people in this book are anonymous. Anybody could have written this. Anyone could have made it up. You know, I got very, very skeptical about that. And that's why I started going back to the pre to the time before that book came out, you know. But people don't know that there are books on this subject. They don't know where to look. Maybe now with the internet it's a little easier, but the, the ridiculous thing is I wrote my book for people who don't know there are books, which means that they're not going to go looking for it. <laughs> so that was sort of cutting my own throat, really. But if I can get them to people who are grieving or people who are going through anxiety somehow, then it might help them. Mm. What else do you have in your book? I'm assuming you hear, have personal stories. and I have lots of personal stories. Um, I have, for instance, um, oh, I could tell you, I suppose, I, yes, I can tell you that one night um, there was about one o'clock in the morning, I was asleep, My mother was asleep. This was back in 2008. And there were three very loud bangs on the front door, loud knocks. And, of course, I leapt out of bed. My mother called out from her bedroom, who can it be at this hour of the night? I looked through the window. I looked everywhere. Very quiet neighborhood. Don't have children playing jokes or anything like that. 
absolutely nothing. Nobody around anywhere. In fact, I actually said, I remember saying, there's not a soul in sight. The next morning, the phone rang to say that my father had died at one o'clock in the morning. I hadn't seen my father for many years, but wow. my parents were divorced. And I remembered saying I didn't see a soul. And I thought, well, I probably wouldn't, would I? <laughs> but um, that's one one of them. Look, lots of stories. I, actually, there's some very interesting um, um, NDE stories that I that I gathered up. Sure, too, sure. I were Your beautiful. stories are great, um, Sandy. They're just great. And I'm yeah. loving listening. And I'll still buy Thanks. the book. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, oh, well, I'm still not going to tell you the ending. Um, All right. What, <laughs> you will find out. One of them was um, when Dr. Sam Pania, who's an um, intensive care doctor, um, was giving a, a lecture. And there was a doctor in the audience called, I'm not, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, Dr. Tom Ofterhide, I think it was. And he stood up and wanted to relate an incident that happened to him because when he when this happened, he'd been a doctor for a whole five days and he's you know, very green around the gills and he'd been sent to see a heart attack patient but while he was talking to him, the patient had a, a cardiac arrest as he was introducing himself and he was so inexperienced that he, the first thing he thought of was, how could you do this to me? <laughs> you know, as you would. And he gave him an electric shock, but but the patient just kept on having cardiac arrest and he kept on staying with him, giving him more and more shocks to bring him back. He was there, Sandra, for eight hours, this poor young doctor. Oh, no. And he was tired and he was hungry and but he couldn't leave because every time he brought him back, he'd have another cardiac arrest. So the the nurse brought the patient's lunch in, and the doctor was so hungry he just ate it at the bedside while he was looking after this oh, man. Oh my you know? goodness! And it took thirty days for the patient to get better. And after he did, he called the the doctor in and told him about his near death experience, and he told him about a tunnel and a light and conversations he had with deceased loved ones and all of that which the doctor was you know a five day doctor and he wasn't too sure that this fellow wasn't a bit off um, but then the, the patient said to him and here I was dying in front of you and you were thinking to yourself how could you do this to me and then you ate my lunch <laughs> <laughs> you can't get away with anything if somebody's dead you know wow so, there's and um, Melvin Morse, the paediatrician Melvin Morse, tells a very funny story about, um, well, I found it funny anyway. He uh, had a, a young boy who was going to have a tonsillectomy, and he had the boy in his, his office, and he was explaining about what was involved in taking his tonsils out, and no doubt he was telling him all about the ice cream he was going to get afterwards and everything. And the boy had come with his grandfather, and his grandfather was sitting at the back, and he... Dr. Morse thought he was dozing off to sleep, you know. And he finished explaining it all to him and the, the grandfather looked up and he said, you didn't tell him about the tunnel. Oh. <laughs> and of course, immediately Dr. Morse was far more interested in the grandfather than, than the grandson. You uh -huh. know? But the grandfather wouldn't tell him anything after that. I mean, the grandfather was obviously getting on in years. So it had had to have been many, many years before. So we're going back to the probably the turn of the century when the grandfather had obviously had a tons tonsillectomy and thought that the tunnel was part of it. Right. You know, it was a natural part of the operation. So, Oh, Sandy, I have a yeah. funny a funny story. I just remembering somebody told me I met uh, some folks that were paramedics and they had an ambulance call and they said that they had found this woman in her bathtub and she's a very obese woman and she flatlined and they had to resuscitate her. And so they had to pull her out of the bathtub onto the floor. And one of the men made a very condescending negative comment about the woman's size. Okay. And so they were able to jumpstart her, get her to the hospital, uh, whatever. So don't you know that 
the woman actually did have a near death experience because she heard the comment the man made mm-hmm. about her size and there's no yep. way she could have it, you know exactly. flatlined so she actually went and found this troop of paramedics and yelled at the man <laughs> and everybody oh. was just went white as a ghost couldn't believe that she witnessed and she even told more examples of what she saw and yeah. And so this woman, she never told, she hasn't been telling people the story, but she told me because she knew I wrote the book and she said, I believe, I believe. How could you not? I mean, when you have that 1% doubt, you just have to think of those stories. And why would, well, not only why would people be making them up, but they can't be making them up if they repeat them back to the doctor. And it's true. You know, they repeat a joke back or they repeat a comment back or they get upset because the doctor ate, ate your lunch or something oh, like that. You funny. Know? Even to hear their thoughts, not only their speech, but their thoughts. And one of the, the I found absolutely fascinating was George Redoni. Do you know of George Redoni no. at all? No. Oh, oh, Sandra, he's amazing. He was a, a Russian scientist and he wanted, he had an opportunity to go to America, to work in America. And he was given permission, but the KGB didn't want him to go. So his family was all waiting at the, were waiting at the airport. And he was on the way to the airport and he was run over by a car. Oh, um, wow. I don't think it was an accident because the car then backed up and ran over him a second time. Wow. Um, so he was taken to the morgue. He was declared dead, taken to the morgue, um, put in the freezer. This was Friday afternoon. He was taken out of the freezer on Monday morning to have the autopsy. And it was when they put the knife in to do the autopsy that he woke up. No, you're kidding me. I am not kidding. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think if I was even perfectly healthy and got put in a freezer from Friday afternoon or Friday night until Monday morning, I don't think I'd survive that, let alone having been run over by a car twice. But while he was away, um, he, he was talking to this newborn baby who had been born to his neighbors. And this baby... It was about five days old and it had been crying and crying and crying and they'd taken it to hospital and nobody could find out what was wrong with it. So while George was in the freezer, I mean, what are you going to do when you're in a freezer for the weekend? You know, you've got to talk to somebody. Um, he was talking to the baby and the baby explained that she had a broken hip. So when he was better, eventually, um, he went and told his neighbours, they took her to the hospital, had an x-ray, guess what, she had a broken hip. That's incredible. Now, how do you explain that? And and one of the one of the things that I think to the scientists are discovering now is the transformations that people go through mm-hmm. after their near death experience. I mean, their whole life changes. George Redonia, who was a a scientist, eventually did get to America and became a minister of religion. Yes. He just didn't want to be a scientist anymore, you know? Yeah. So, and and his life changed in many ways. But you're absolutely right. You you can't doubt when you hear these stories. And, um, you know, they're they're just just incredible. Um, I also wanted to tell you about Dr. Wiltz because I love Dr. Wiltz. Dr. Wiltz died in 1889 of typhoid fever. And what I loved about him was that he died, left his body, looked back at it, and he said, I just love this oldie-worldie phrase. He said, the body and I no longer had any interests in common. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? But he walked to heaven. He he didn't go through a tunnel. In fact, I actually dug up about five or Well, they didn't dig them up, please, not, not right. actually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I found about five or six people who walked to heaven instead of going through a tunnel. Um, and Dr. Wiltz was one of them. Um, he walked away from his body. He actually described the whole process of leaving his body. 
um, and he said something fascinating. He said something about um, he felt his himself coming away and cracking at the hips or something like that. And I thought, oh, sort of something similar to what my grandmother said. Yeah. Um, but when he was walking along the um, road to heaven, he, as as you do, um, he came across a large rock that was a boundary and a cloud came over the rock and spoke to him. Now, this was getting a little bit beyond my comfort zone, as you can imagine. Yes. Because the cloud says, once you pass this rock, you can't go back to the body. And he said, well, that's okay, because, you know, he didn't particularly want to go back to the body, because, as he said, they didn't have any interest in common. So he started walking again, and the cloud, this is, this is interesting for a lesson for all of us. The cloud said to him, if your work was to write the things that have been taught you, waiting for a mere chance to publish them, if your work was to talk to private individuals in the privacy of friendship, if this was all, it's done and you may pass beyond the rocks. So he was delighted because he didn't want to have to die a second time. So he went to take another step and the cloud came closer and said, but... If, upon consideration, you conclude that it shall be to publish as well as to write what you are taught, if it shall be to call together the multitudes and teach them, it is not done and you can return to your body. And so he woke up in bed. Oh, fantastic. It's a mission. You know, we all have something we need to do. We We're do. We're all here for a reason. And that was his reason. That's a great story. Are these, are these kind of stories in your book? All of them are in my book. Love yeah. it. And more. But, but These and more. And more. And more. And there's, there's famous people too, I found. Um, I found, like, Dr. Carl Jung had an NDE. Did he? And in 1944. And, and what was really amazing about him is that he, it's, he said, it seemed to me that I was high up in space. He zoomed out. He didn't go through a tunnel. He just zoomed out into the universe. And he said, far below I saw the globe of the earth bathed in a gloriously blue light. I saw the deep blue sea and the continents. Its global shape was plainly distinguishable and its outline shone with a silvery green gleam through a wonderful blue light. Now, you know, it took 17 years before anybody, Gagarin, went out that far in space. Yes. And, and when um, Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, um, went... 30 years later, he wrote about looking from space upon a sparkling blue and white jewel, a light, delicate sky blue sphere, which were almost identical words to Jung's. But in 1944, and who knew that in 1944? You know, um, Ernest Hemingway had one, um, and he felt his soul fly out of his out of his body like a handkerchief out of a pocket. Wow. Um, Dr. Livingston. Oh, you know Dr. Livingston, no. I presume. Do I? I don't... Wait. He, was, he was a missionary, um, medical missionary in Africa. Okay. And and uh, he was attacked by a lion and nearly ripped to pieces. They wow. actually ended up building a statue of it. But um, he, he said... It was it was interesting because his only emotion was intense curiosity as to which part of his body the lion would have next. Wow. Which I, I know, that's what I thought. But he later said, because the lion shook him. Have you ever seen an animal shake something when they're going to eat it or before they eat it? He said that this peculiar state is probably produced in all animals killed by carnivore. And if so, it's a merciful, merciful provision by our beloved creator for lessening the pain of death. And apparently when the lion shook him, he had no pain. He didn't feel anything but, oh, I wonder which part of me is going to eat next, you know? So. Wow. You know, it's funny. I've been, you've been following me a little bit on Facebook. I've been following these eagles that are in a big nest. There's different eagles around the well, the U.S. and there's a live camera right on the uh, right on the nest. So I've actually seen the the mama and daddy eagles sitting on the eggs, and then the eggs hatch, and then you know the little baby eagles are, are starting to grow up. But the reason I bring this up is the uh, every bit of food that comes in 
you know, it's either a fish or a bird or uh, once it was even a chicken. Um, but the eagles will, you know, like the head goes first. It's almost like they, they kill the, the animal so the animal doesn't suffer before right. eating the right. meat. And did, and they shake it, do they, before they kill it? Or you, I guess you don't see the actual kill, do you? I don't see the actual kill, no. But no. Uh, the heads are always off these things before right. they partake in it. Right. I thought, interesting. Right. Well, we, we feed um, birds in our backyard. They come down and actually take it out of our hands. And we feed them mincemeat with certain vitamins and things like that put in. And I always find that when they take it, they always shake it, which is wonderful because it splatters all over the place and I have to clean it up. Mm-hmm. But it's a natural instinct for them to shake it before they kill it because apparently that stops them feeling any pain, which for an animal lover like I am, and I know you are, um, is, is a great relief because I'd hate to think of, you know, when, when an animal kills another one that it's, there's pain involved. But according to Dr. Livingston, no, there isn't. That's fantastic. So a lot of interesting people. I'm just trying to think of what else. Sandy, I, I love. I mean, I love it. I love these stories because there's not things I could find on my own. I mean, I'm sure digging. There's plenty of oh, stories, look, but if, Sandra, if it hadn't have been for the internet for a start, I mean, I, I, it, I didn't get everything from the internet, but it gave me um, a starting point to go and find certain books that I didn't. That there were things in, like, like. It's fine if you buy a book on NDEs, but who would go out and buy um, a book about a, a colonel in the First World War or something like that? But that, like, like Doctor um, Admiral Byrd, an explorer, wrote a book called Alone. He had a near-death experience, and that was back in the 1920s in the Arctic when he was exploring the Arctic. Well, it's not a kind of book I'd go and buy, no. but I'd find out that he had one. And then I could go and get the book and, and read what he said about it. And in fact, he had a life review um, in his in the 1920s. Um, but you're right, you know, you, you, it took me three years to track all these down um, after I decided that that's what I was going to do. And it's it's not easy for most people to find these. Uh, I must just read this to you okay. um, about a tunnel. A young boy told pediatrician Dr. Morse, I went into a huge noodle. It wasn't like a spiral noodle, but it was very straight like a tunnel. When I told my mum about it, I told her it was a noodle. But now I'm thinking it must have been a tunnel because it had a rainbow in it. And I don't think a noodle has a rainbow. Oh. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But, um, you know, there's the, there's the kind of accounts that sort of bring it to life because that's a, a very young boy sure. who's just trying to explain what he saw, you know. And it's um, sometimes not easy for adults, let alone for children, although they tend to be more open and honest about what they saw. and They don't worry about what people are going to no. think. No, Sandy, I've got a good story. I was sitting next to a man on an airplane and we started drinking. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing, he was a cute young man. This was several years ago. And one thing led to another, and I started um, telling him about my search at that point for, is there life after death? And he says, well, I have a story for you. And he told me that he brought his two young sons to some lake and one of the boys, they were trying to potty train, or he was trying to potty train. So he was waiting just outside the uh, the restroom and he didn't notice, but he looks over his shoulder and the younger boy, who was just maybe, I don't know, two or three years old, was gone. So he rushes down and he he gets to the lake. And of course, his son is floating in the water, had drowned. So he brings the son out, tries to resuscitate him. Of course, the ambulance comes. They, they were able to resuscitate him. They bring him to the hospital. And so this man tells me, he says, when uh, finally the boy came to and he could talk to him, he asked, you know, what were you doing? I was so scared. And the son said, well, daddy, I wanted to be a big boy. I wanted to swim. And he wanted to swim like the other kids. And he says, well, then what happened? He says, oh, I couldn't swim because I don't know how. And then he said, then he said, I started drinking all the water. And then he said, then I started floating to the sky 
Ah. And then he says, and then the big face in the sun was there and told me that it's too soon to come home and that I need to go back to you, daddy. So, Ah. so here I am kind of one of those things. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. And so this little boy ended up, you know, the father obviously had a lot of guilt, but the more I spoke with the dad, I said, what kind of son is your, is he now? Oh, all he wants to do is volunteer and help people. And so I mean, he's turned into, yeah. So we had a really great conversation and a bottom line at the end of the, all the alcohol and all the, uh, the conversation. (laughs) And you were able to remember that? (laughs) Yeah. But but he, well, no, we didn't drink that much, just a couple glasses of wine. But (laughs) bottom line is the man was able to let go of his guilt, seeing that maybe this was necessary for his son's growth as his soul and to see all the good that the son is doing for people. You know, right. And so, yeah. yeah so I, had, I just put a different perspective on it. But yeah, a little boy couldn't make up the big face in the sun and having that conversation. Oh, exactly. And he didn't read Dr. Moody's book. He didn't, did he? <laughs> oh. Exactly. So well, children are a great source of, yeah. of, of information about these things because I think a lot of people, uh, well, obviously, a lot of people are a bit afraid of talking about it because they think they're going to be laughed yes, at. Of course. Um, and and I often say to, to people who say that they're interested in the subject but they've got nobody to talk to about it. And I say, well, try. You might be surprised because 50 years ago, people would turn away from discussions about this. But one lady, I said, look, go back to work. She worked with about 20 people. I said, go back to work and just mention it to them and just see. And she turned, it turned out that about three quarters of the people who worked with her were all fascinated in the subject, but they didn't talk about it because they thought that they would be laughed at as well. So, you know, if more people talk about it. There's, there, there are deaf cafes all over the world now where people are actually getting together and, and just discussing their fears or their wow. grief and that sort of thing, which is really a wonderful thing, you know, for, for them to do. Um, but when you mentioned about um, uh, how people change and this little boy changing, this happens to so many people. And one one lady is um, I found fascinating is Diane Corcoran, who was an army field nurse in Vietnam in the late 1960s. And she kept hearing about NDEs and she got very interested in them and started studying them. And now she works tirelessly educating the military about NDEs because the military, when she did a, a, a lecture and asked everybody and she had like 200 people in the audience, they were all military, um, how many people have heard of NDEs? Two people put their hand up. Um, what happens, unfortunately, is these people get sent to military psychiatrists, they get put on medication because they're obviously losing it. Um, And what she found, because they change so much after their NDE, and it's a much higher rate of NDEs in the military, of course, because they get wounded, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, the generals are not usually impressed by soldiers who want to love their enemy to death. And that's basically <laughs> what happens. They don't want to fight anymore. They don't want to kill anybody. You know, so that's why they put them on medication, get back there with a gun, you know. Uh, what's her so name, she, did you say? That sorry? Woman? What is her name? Uh, Diane Corcoran. Wow. C-O-R-C-O-R-A-N. And she's been working for years now to try and educate the military. What on. a wonderful thing. What, I Sa- know. Sandy, our time is almost up. Believe it or not, we just started. Doesn't I? Doesn't it feel that way? (laughs) Mm. (laughs) Is there anything else you want to share before Ah, we wrap it up? I want to share. Look, just one little thing that I'd like to read to you, and I'm just looking for it when I as I speak. This has been so much fun, Um, by the way. Sorry, it's been so much fun talking with you. Oh, it has. It has. Alan Lewis was. um, an Australian industrial chemist who had a, he had actually died three times at school back in 1946. Um, I won't go into his story, but, um, uh, because you can read all about it in the book, but he did say, hang on, where is it? Um, he did say, Oh, no, I can't find it now. But he's, he did say that it's not such a bad thing to die. He's been there three times. And he said that the people who suffer are the people who are left behind. Yes. But those who go, they're fine. If you've got to grieve, 
grieve for yourself because they deserve to be missed, but don't grieve because they don't exist anymore. Because this, they're happy, they're fine. I cried for 24 years, Sandra, because I knew my mother was dying. It was a long process. Mm -hmm. When she died, I didn't. Because it was a release for her and I knew she was absolutely fine. Mm. And my next book is going to be about that sort of thing. Communication, signs they send us and where they go. Not yet. I've started the research and it's a long, long process. So the book probably will be another year or two. But there's a lot of information that I've gathered about that. Wow. Well, when that comes out, we'll definitely talk again and share absolutely. it. Oh, Sandy, this has been such a delight. Oh, you have been as well, and, oh. and I learned so much from you. Oh, thanks. Thanks. And just a reminder to our listener, Sandy Coughlin's book is called Heaven Knows, A Personal Journey in Search of Evidence, and it's a beautiful blue book, blue, called The Color Blue. Uh, and yeah. if you're listening to this on YouTube, just beneath in this description, I have a link um, that you can see the book, and Amazon is the link. We can find it wherever you find it. What are you going to say, Sandy? It's um, available at Amazon as a Kindle and a paperback. But Fantastic. unfortunately, the paperback is only on the American or the um, UK side. The paperback is available in Australia for anyone who's listening in Australia. Okay. But you would you would need to um, uh, contact me. Uh, so I might just send you my uh, website and they can order it through there if they'd like to, if anyone yes. in Australia. It's, it's, it is available in bookshops, but unfortunately bookshops don't realize it and um, we're having difficulty getting it into the bookshops at the moment. But yeah. it's certainly available in, in the States. What's your website, UK. Sandy? It's bookorphanage.com. Book That's B-O-O-K-O-R-P-H-A-N-A-G-E, bookorphanage.com. Dot com, okay. That's an interesting name. <laughs> well, we actually run a, a second-hand bookshop as well, so yeah. we adopt books and, and find good, own, good homes for them. Oh, Sandy, thank you so much for being our guest today. Oh, thank you, it and I didn't great. think I'd have anything to say. Isn't that funny? <laughs> but you know what? You have your passion, and once you it is. share that, I mean, there's plenty to say. There always is, and I get nervous it's before every interview. <laughs> Oh, no. I just thought you usually interview people who have had MDEs or a psychics or something, and all I did was write a book. Oh, all you did was write a book. See yeah. how we downplay who we are. Yeah, I know Isn't that do. silly? I but like... you have such you have such fascinating guests, Sandra. As are you. Uh, yeah, you, know, you yeah. are, and it's interesting. And even for anyone listening right now. It, you don't have to be an author. You don't have to have had a near-death experience. Uh, just a real heartfelt belief and some stories to share why you believe yeah, exactly. we don't yeah. die. Yeah, That's what this is about. Mm. Yeah, and help people a con- live a contact good life. with a loved one. Or, yeah, there's so uh, many I mean, things. Uh, we all like listening to those. We we all love listening mm-hmm. to your show anyway. But when people are just ordinary people who've got something that happened to them that changed their lives, it's always something that, that affects us all. Right, right. Oh, thank so you so much. So other people get on yep. Sandra's show. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's getting exciting. I get lots of emails from people, and I'm thinking, God, I don't have enough time to get to everybody. Oh, of but, but I will. Do. I will. There's of, no problem. The universe will make time for what you need to do. It it is, and I love that these. Well, and if someone is missing the show, I mean, there's 170 past episodes. Certainly by now, you've forgotten something that's happened in one of the earlier ones. And I'm sure our yeah. lives change. We're we're different people. A couple of years in a couple of years time, and we hear something new again. It's like we we're hearing it for the first oh, time, based on what we're dealing you, with. Yeah. Right. You you hear something, yeah. It's even it's like watching a movie that you might have been not picked up certain things the first time around, and then as you learn things, you watch it again. Oh, that's what that was about, you know. So yeah. I agree totally. Yeah. All right, well, Sandy, thank you. Well, thank you, Sandra. Thank you for being such a wonderful interviewer and letting me 
waffle on there. There's no waffling. No, and I want to remind our listener to check out Sandy's book, Heaven Knows, A Personal Journey in Search of Evidence. And what makes me so excited, Sandy, is that I I could listen to you for hours, tell these stories, but it's all in the book. Don't tempt tempt me, Sandra. Don't tempt me. No, no, (laughs) no. Time to go. Time to go. And for our listener. I hope everybody enjoys it. And thank you very, very much for a lovely show and a lovely chat. Oh, you're welcome. And for our listener, thank you for taking this past hour to be with Sandy and I. Uh, What a great storyteller she is. I'm really fascinated. And I want to just remind you, all past episodes are available on wedontdieradio.com. And there's lots of them to see. And then also, if you are grieving, and if you want to join what I call my Insiders Club, you can read a free copy of my book, as well as there's a very healing audio called How to Survive Grief. So that's my gift to you. And remember, I'd love to meet you in person. I'll be at the in Scottsdale, Arizona at the Afterlife Symposium, September 15th through 17th. And you can find out more at afterlifestudies.org. And if you'd like, and you're on Facebook, come join our private community of like-minded people. So just type into the search box, We Don't Die Listeners. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain. I'm grateful I get to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is very important. So I want to thank you for listening and we'll see you soon. (music) 